the remote is Velcro on the post. Hang on, I'll time you. That's obviously been a dismal failure. Okay. <laughs> So we are the Holistic Development and Analytics Group, and uh, if you guys saw our last presentation, which all of you did, um, <laughs> it, was, it was focused really intensely on data collection for individual growth and sort of how that data is evaluated. You remember badges and that system. But we kind of took a step back and said, hold on a second, what are the conditions needed for that development? What are the conditions that the university is providing right now that it thinks provide individual development? but what actually are the conditions that actually can be facilitated that not only inform a student's journey through the system, but also inform data and also inform mentorship to the system. So that was kind of how we evolved our questions. So we're going to take a look at that right now. Um, and so this, was, this is our big idea that carries us through our, our new presentation. Um, we're looking at spaces where students are committed to deep exploratory engagement. So not only going with what they know, but also being exposed to things that were unknown to them far before, like, like Plato. Um, and there, it's an integrated setting, um, which, is, which is something that's talked about a lot if you read the Formation by Design Report. It talks about integrating the sort of uh, well-being elements, empathy elements, and resilience elements into one. And these are spaces that not only include feedback, but also include challenges and a chance to reflect on it. Reflect on it both individually, but also with a mentor who later on we call a shirt off. And so here's an outline of our general presentation here. We're going to start off by defining holistic development, exactly what it is. And eventually we're going to go and look at what's impeding holistic development at the current system at Georgetown right now. And that's based on not only on what we see, but also what other students have said as well. Um, we're also going to look at sort of these learning communities we can craft based on what students desire. And then we're also going to move on to how they can be guided. Can data inform it and can mentorship inform it? And we'll ask some questions at the end. So right now, this is Father Kevin O'Brien. And the university right now, it's intent on creating an, an environment that's filled with holistic development. It has things in place. The issue with it right now is that it's siloed. So you have levels of development and well-being and resilience in a classroom. You have those elements in a project with CSJ. You have that with an experiential learning uh, um, experience outside of the classroom. You have a mentor there. But the issue is those aren't necessarily integrated together. If you talk to students, they'll say that their experience you know, at the, as the head of a club has nothing to do with what they're learning in the classroom, but they're both sort of growing them up. So, so how do you sort of merge those together? Uh, but first, before we do that, we should probably define what holistic learning is. Uh, and so this is what, you, this should look pretty familiar. Um, this is four areas of holistic development as we see them. Self, relationships, workplace, and the public. Uh, with the self, you see things that aren't necessarily academically based, but sort of based on resilience, purpose, the values that you get from your experience as you journey through the university, and then how do you take what you learn and how do you move those out into personal relationships, how do you move those out in the world, and how do you move those out into a sort of public service social justice environment. And so, so we have a sample student here, we have Numan, uh, who's going to be entering the university in 2040. And so within that environment, we think that there are certain needs for the <laughs> In order to enable that, we want a university that has those mechanisms in place. Uh, so just to break a couple of these down pretty quickly for you guys, we have time. Obviously, we don't want to send anyone into a system that has you know, four years, eight semesters. We want to give people the ability to learn at their own pace, whether that's more quickly than the current norm, or whether it's longer than the current norm. Uh, we also want to create spaces where reflection is integrating, uh, integrated into every aspect of learning, whether it is, like Connor mentioned, in a classroom or in a CSJ. Um, any of those different elements of the current university. Uh, we want to produce people who have the ability to engage in creative endeavors to actually build things to pick up on some of those elements we mentioned earlier. Um, obviously, one of the objectives of the university is to create knowledge, so we want to provide opportunities for intellectual challenges. Uh, but like Anne has been pushing this entire semester, play is definitely an important element of that as well. It engages a different part of um, a student's I guess, engagement. Um, both with intellectual, creative, as well as reflective issues. Um, again, service, Georgetown is very much committed to that ideal um, that we are living in and for others, and that's part of what a holistic student will leave Georgetown wanting to engage in. Uh, we also want meaningful social interaction. Uh, mentorship is a part of that as well. But tying all of this together is kind of holistic uh, uh, analytics that are actually able to measure how the student is engaging with each of these different needs. 
what those needs are being met, or if there are places that they should be spending more time on, um, et cetera. So we've identified some constraints that we see within the current system that's keeping the university from really accomplishing their goal of holistic development. Uh, these are things like limited opportunities for civic engagement or self-directed learning, uh, lack of social learning, uh, the four-year semester system, and especially the focus on the learning that happens within the classroom. We believe that that's really kept the university from exploring the learning that's happening outside the classroom. Um, the busyness that accompanies a four-year schedule and trying to make everything you want to do activity-wise and course-wise happen within those four years. Uh, the little feedback that you receive as you go through the university and the current academic focus over holistic development. So what does the university need to really accomplish their goal? Going back to our big idea, um, we believe that this framework being implemented can really help the university to foster holistic learning. So we've identified carefully constructed spaces where students are committed to deep exploratory engagement in an integrated academic, social, physical, civic, an introspective community designed around continuous feedback, group projects, challenges, and reflection. So we've identified several mechanisms that we believe would really help the university further their goal. These are things like learning communities, varied levels of engagement within the system, and Sherpa mentorship community designers. All right, so at, at a very high level, learning communities are meant to be a way to kind of uh, chip away at these constraints, um, holding host development back, and also enabling <coughs> creating environments within which a host development can actually happen. So the organizing ideas behind learning communities, you can imagine this to be kind of theme-based, so you, can, you will enter one around the topic of economic development or um, fancy literature, whatever it may be. Um, Within the, within the learning community, you basically have the organizing ideas are one centered around physical, mental, and emotional health. So it goes beyond just uh, living in a given place and going to class, but actually joining a community where you are very deliberately taking steps in all these areas. And also, kind of what we talked about before um, components of service, reflection, and search, um, academic integration with these components. So, trying to and deliberately tie in your academics with reflection, with service, with what role you can play in the world with this with skills and knowledge you are gaining. However, at the same time, we also want to leave room for kind of software and exploration within the community. So for example, you, you are in a development community and you kind of build your own niche within the niche. Um, along with that, there's the idea of social interaction and integration. So make, make this a social learning environment not just you sitting in the classroom having a professor lecture at you. And lastly is the idea of continuous feedback. So right now the feedback is that we receive in classes is usually um, a series of grades this semester, then a final grade at the end. Whereas this system we imagine the feedback is much tighter and to have a much richer set of data coming back at you. Um, the people in the learning community we're looking at, um, students, professors, alumni, and the Sherpa, um, so we have nailed down exactly what this role each one will play. The Sherpa is something kind of that we envision to be kind of new, which we'll talk about more in depth later, but what you can think about right now is um, it's someone who is basically a mentor for a group of students, and all the data is being collected, um, whether, whether it be through, uh, through reflections, through various sorts of quantitative data being measured, uh, such as like, you know, local finality or the way you interact with people in person or in groups through simulations, for example. Um, all that is getting fed into the Sherpa who can then offer very personalized, customized guidance to um, students in learning communities. And lastly is uh, pedagogy behind learning communities. The idea is that we want to go beyond just, uh, it is a community, right? So you can do more than just take classes there. So we have things like not only classes, but also, uh, for example, office tutorials, mastermind groups, Scrum Masters, which is basically an agile development used to rapidly iterate over um, products, but in this case you can think about it as rapidly iterating over classes or curriculums. So having students kind of design their own path to a certain topic. Uh, as well as project-based learning, which we'll outsource to our PBL team over there. Um, and then the idea of virtual reality and simulations, and also problem-based learning, slightly different model of 
And so the next thing we kind of wanted to add to the system is various levels of engagement, because we understand that when we're dealing with something like holistic learning, it is a very intensive process that requires a lot of commitment from students. And not every student is going to be wanting, is going to want to engage with Georgetown on that level. And this is kind of something we see as a place where we can really innovate by creating various levels of engagement. Um, so kind of on the very fringe, of engagement with Georgetown, you have things like, like MOOCs, right? You can sit in your computer thousands of miles away, just watch this course happen in front of you, maybe take an online assessment, but other than that, not really engage in any discussion or anything like that, right? Um, to kind of an academic setting, which is what we have now, designed around a seminar system where you sit across from people, or even if it's a nerve, right, you sit online, but still across from like 10 or 14 other people, have a discussion, engage with the topic. Um, and then kind of the extreme end is these learning communities that require you to live very intentionally during your time here at Georgetown. And along with these different levels of commitment, we imagine that there are greater opportunities for you to actually grow as an individual and fulfill all those characteristics that Connor mentioned earlier uh, that go into building what we think is a whole person here at Georgetown. Um, and so kind of the highest level of engagement, because that's the newest part, that's why I want to describe it a little bit further. Um, that would be something like agreeing to, uh, I guess, track all of your data and all of your progress throughout this. So, that's, that means you know, your vocal tonality, actually wear that monitor, wear that Fitbit, have all of your data collected throughout this process. And I know some of the concerns you ran into earlier were, you know, as a student, do you want to be having all of your well-being indicators measured by the university? So that's something you're not into, but you have the ability to engage with Georgetown on a less intense level. But if you are interested in that deeper level, then we commit to this. Um, and so something else we see is really key to this more committed community uh, is the feedback loops that we're going to have within the rest of this, right? So, for example, when you graduate, right, when you completed um, your time here, whether that's two years, four years, six years, whatever that means, um, you're going to come back either as an alumni, provide your experience back into the kind of the Sherpa mentoring system, which is saying, like, oh, so you know, two years out, these are the skills that I think are most valuable, this is what I've developed the most, this is the pathway I'm taking, um, and input that directly back into the community so others have experience with that. Um, or it could be coming back and serving as somebody who actually teaches a MOOC later on about some basic skills that you've picked up. Um, or even engaging as you know, a peer mentor within this academic system. So you have the ability, and something else I should mention, you actually have the ability to enter um, the university at any of these levels, right? So you can enter it here at the MOOC level, academic level, or come in as you know, a freshman who's interested in this holistic learning and directly into this community. Or you can also, as you become more and more comfortable with the way the university works, move throughout the system as well. So there are two directions of movement, uh, vertical as well as horizontal. And one, one thing I want to mention very quickly is that one, one way to possibly uh, forward this, uh, this uh, idea is to think about um, our university experience, a series of loops. Like you might be spending some time on basic online, but then go to a learning community come out of that to an academic setting and then maybe go somewhere else, right? Depending on kind of where you are in your life, your interest, and where you are in the world even. Ah, uh, yes, the Sherpa. <coughs> uh, so we basically see the Sherpa as, as a new uh, new role uh, that will be that will be a key for the learning community. And these are basically some of the um, ideas that we think are essential for including Sherpa. We have the exploration of being able to um, look at data and figure out uh, what what this means and provide guidance based on that data. Um, a lot of time for reflection, so basically uh, making sure that the, the student is kind of making sense of their own their own journey um, and having kind of like you know, having those feedback groups where students will kind of go to something, get information and come back and then iterate over that. Um, provide contact support for implementation. The idea is that uh, as a Sherpa, you basically will have some sort of decision-making power to be able to kind of um, not only guide the student, but also um, maybe remove obstacles of, of some sort or connect them with uh, specific people at the university or outside the university who can further, that, further them along their path and hopes of development. Uh, focus of accountability. The idea is that as a student, you have many goals, you have many ambitions. Um, here is someone who can kind of not only give you feedback, but also make sure that you are achieving those goals when you want to. And lastly, data analytics. So the Sherpa will have to be um, technical of some sort, because we envision a, basically a system of um, 
data collection software and then gadgets and hardware. Um, and APIs all feed into a database. And being able to kind of set up this database to track the metrics that the students want to track or that the students are about to reach track um, will be a necessary skill for the Sherpa role. And I will add something to you. Something interesting about this is a lot of what this is is actually based off of a precedent of mentorship in entrepreneurship. Uh, from different articles that we read on mentorship and how that relates to starting in businesses and how business mentors work. And so that's interesting because not only is it allowing a student to be creative and encouraging creativity, but it's using someone's expertise from their own path to help someone new uh, blaze their own path. So just like you would be blazing a trail in business, a student is actually blazing a new trail through their academic experience in Georgetown. So that's really fascinating. Uh, cool. And with that, these are just the major questions that kind of we still want to address going forward. Um, and we can kind of talk about these all quickly. Uh, I mean, down the board, you can read them too. <laughs> and they can maybe prompt some of the questions you're all about to ask us right now. <laughs> Thank you. Didn't you? I'm sorry. So you got this question. Didn't you have a slide that showed that learning communities was one of three things? Yeah. But then, then did you spend all your time talking about learning communities? Yeah. So we focus mostly on learning communities because that was kind of the newer model in the levels of engagement. So you have kind of the online model, and you have the academic kind of what we have right now in the residential system. The learning community was kind of a step up. That was meant to be a bit more intentional and deliberate about post development. Oh, I see. That's the new mechanism of engagement. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah. In that three level of, levels of commitment, how flexible is like exiting out? Like, if you go in more, like, quite often one you can chew and realize afterwards, are you allowed to like exit easily, or if you're just not as interested in say, so learning? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think one thing to uh, the different way we thought about this one was maybe coming in with some sort of project or challenge that you want to accomplish in this learning community. Um, so and then your exit might be like, you know, either accomplishing that or kind of maybe you know, choosing that this is for you. Another way to think about it is that there's lots of iteration within the community itself, right? So you come in with something and you find that it's not working out, you need to be able to pivot within that. How, how is your learning community different from an inquiry group? I, we imagine it to be a bit more intense, I think. Yeah. I think it was just a uh, longer term, maybe. Um, uh, the, the actual like, living is, is actually, you know, uh, living is also a condition of the learning community. So kind of, you know, you're all living together. It's also this idea of you're going beyond just um, the, the projects but you're also incorporating like physical, emotional, social health, um, as well as sense making of your own as individuals. It seems a bit limiting that you could, like, if I understood this correctly, like, be part of just like one learning community, because like what I really like about like, the other model is that you could be part of like, multiple inquiry groups, so a lot of different like, interests and aspects of your personality could be incorporated. So why did you end up choosing the model where you picked just like one learning community? I think it's because you actually iterated through that, right? So at one point, so parts of what they were talking about were actually incorporated into this. So when you talk about a learning community, it's just the group of students within the system that are more intensively engaged in this process, right? So within that, there's iteration, as Ozzy mentioned. So there is an influx between different communities where you're focused on different things, whether it's the project that you're currently on, or whether it's the lifestyle you're trying to live at that particular moment. And that's something that your Sherpa actually helps guide you to. So they're talking about an algorithm that amalgamates everything and says, oh, maybe you should be moving this direction or this direction. In that in this case we actually have the Sherpa that helps you decide which direction within that community you could be moving. There's a follow up question. So you can move from the, like one level community to another. Yeah. Right? Like, there's no permanent. Yeah. So you can do that like like six months or six weeks. Yeah, and then when you feel ready to move on to another one then mm -hmm. keep it. There's also the idea of not only moving from learning learning community to learning community, but also for example going from learning community to an online model to an academic model, and like a, maybe it's kind of like more traditional, or a radicalized traditional model, but then like, you know, going back into a learning community later on. So you can 
some students might might have four LC learning community experiences, others might have eight. You know, so it's like it can it can vary. Yep. Um, I think you guys just heard this in that comment, but maybe you talk about the learning communities like as soon as you start the presentation. But I think you guys talked a lot about other stuff in the beginning, and then I didn't get that learning communities was the main aspect of the presentation until like halfway through. And then I think if you do that, you'll have a lot more time to talk in depth about why the learning community is so radical. Because it kind of like was, it's just like there right now that if you like have more detail on it, it'll actually come off as very different from just like what we have now. By the way, sure, folks, I really like the idea of job and having that, that ongoing relationship. My question is about the way that the data is connected to it, because it seems like it's just it, it's a little bit just added on. We can collect data about people, so therefore it will make this process better somehow. So my question is, will that work without all that data collection? Kind of one, so maybe on two levels. One, what is the um, the role that that data analytics is doing that students produce this data? How does it feed back in? Would this work without that? Is maybe the practical question, what is the data doing? Because the conceptual question behind that, for me, is that there's some tension there that the more data you provide, the more that my actions get quantified into discrete bits and, and measurable things, I'm somehow more holistic. And that seems like an a odd tension thinking of gaming the system. I mean, simply by getting more, being parts of more data, how does that mean that? And I'm in some ways, that's kind of been a tension within our group this entire time. Uh, and that was actually an issue we ran into at the midterm was there was really intense quantifying what people were doing, whether it be a race, like the tough modern in our midterm, or even like someone's grade in a class and their growth from class to class. And so that's why we moved on to something that on the surface seems more qualitative, but is actually best based on data, and that's the Sherpa. Uh, and the Sherpa's role is really to interpret whatever data the student will provide. And that's the interesting part of having a spectrum of what's provided to the Sherpa. Yeah, just to build off of that, I think the really key aspect is something else we kind of talked about. This is a good example, right? So if you're wearing a Fitbit, once you reach 10,000 steps, it buzzes, right? So that's your, you know that. You're always conscious of that. Oh, my Fitbit hasn't buzzed yet. I need to walk more today. We don't want students to be in a position where they're actually looking at their data every day and feeling self-conscious about it. Rather, we want them to kind of be producing the data organically, going about their lives as they normally would lead them. And then that's the goal of the Sherpa, which is to take a step back from that and say, okay, now that the student hasn't worried about every little bit of what's going on in their life and what data they're actually producing, now we can draw trends from what was previously unobservable in the whole system. And who are the Sherpas? The vision is the <laughs> new role. So something, I, I mentioned something to be, um, uh, something on the lines of a, uh, a guidance counselor slash Palantir technologist, two sets of data models. Um, I was thinking it was kind of like a dean on steroids. <laughs> uh, yeah, but then you need the technical skills. Right. Well. And how many Sherpas do you need? Like hundreds <laughs> of them? Yeah. You need hundreds of these new things that don't exist? Sure. Yeah, yeah where that, that was one question about, you know, like, how many do we need and how, like, in the larger system, there's something to be said about if we're kind of replacing uh, using Sherpas as a, a substitute to kind of maybe replace the work professors are doing in many cases, or maybe the administration. Um, there, in terms of the cost question, there it might not be as uh, uh, frightening as it might like to be. And additionally, I think we kind of see the system as like there are fewer people who are engaged in the holistic learning of this, right? So in terms of what proportion of this overall community is actually in need of a Sherpa, it might be a lot fewer than perhaps considered part of the greater Georgetown system. Actually, if we go back here, if the idea of with the lines coming down is the idea of kind of like how many people are going to be in each, in each segment, for example. So you have like a narrowing down as you go forward. We've got five minutes left for discussion. Go. Um, so just so I'm clear, there, there will be a adult person who has access to all of my quantitative information that I don't have access to. Yeah. 
Correct. And this person just knows my life. Correct. Inside yeah. out numbers and lets me know as they see fit what information I would like to know about me. I mean, it doesn't have to be because of what you, it's more about then helping you make sense of it. Yeah. And the idea is that over here, these two lines, more opportunity, more commitment, like we are offering you like a lot more, uh, a much more technical space to be, to be able to develop yourself. And as a result, the contract is basically you know, give and take. Like we give you more, but we also require more. Yeah, someone can get a text on your phone saying you should go on a run today. It's not <laughs> <laughs> Well, like, I don't know that I need to go on a run that day. And they're, yeah. Well, I mean, this is like, I sit down with them once every week or something like that, and they walk you through your week's worth of data. And they can show you, like, here's what your actual outcomes were. Like, you weren't exercising enough this week. Try, let's, like, come up with action steps to move forward now. But I don't have access to them. They're the only ones who have access to that data. I mean, that is also, it's also a design choice that has not been known yet. Right, so that, that, that thing's granular, and we can definitely talk about that going forward. But, um, and it's a question of like, you know, how much of the, the, the analysis or the interpretation is evaluative, and how much is meant to be formative. So like, you know, like, you know, like, you know your, your goals, here, here are kind of your goals, um, here's like kind of how you progress towards them, or here's how other people maybe follow how you would do it. Yeah, so just as a, a thought level for you guys, um, this kind of already somewhat exists at West Point because everyone is assigned a training and counseling officer who is responsible for a group of 150 of all four years. And they're kind of mentoring them along in the process, not really academic at all. I mean, they can see the grades and they can check up on your assignments and do all that stuff. But it's mostly just managing your development and maturation as a student to a, a, a graduate. Um, and so that system might be a good precedent for you guys to start with as kind of like because you guys are describing this and going, yeah, I know exactly what it's like to have somebody who lives down the hall from you and he knows literally everything about my life. He knows how many push-ups I can do in two minutes, he knows what I got on my last essay, he knows that I had a fight with the guy next door. They just know everything. But when you train them properly, it actually works pretty well. It helps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that may be part of the answer to my question, but um, my big issue is, yes, I understand that the university is investing more in those few who are doing the learning community setup, but how can you guarantee more opportunity? That's kind of my, like, and how are you defining opportunity? I mean, is that something that, like, you're going to have 80 different people coming to your like writing new recommendations for jobs or like, what is what is opportunity for yourself? The idea is opportunity for, for development, like a more concerted effort to develop yourself in the first not as a professional opportunity. You want like, you know, I spent two years in like kind of maybe normal classes and now it's kind of like a really intense grand job challenging course and you kind of have to kind of face my weaknesses or fears. Okay. I understand but like I I mean, but uh, maybe for the future, um, like we go to Georgetown, everyone's professionally focused. How are you going to incorporate that? We're stepping away from it. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, like it's still there, right? Like it's, it's not like it's the professional yeah. focus isn't, isn't there. This, this is more. I mean, when, when you look at when Randy talks about the 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 mapping session we had for one night, the thing they talk about the most valuable things, things like empathy, things like collaboration. Like that isn't being deliberately cultivated in, at the university, right? Whereas this is meant to be a space to deliberately cultivate those things and prepare for students in some ways to be more effective than uh, in, in the professional sphere than what we have right now. Any last things? I have like a whole bunch of questions about the Sherpas. Like, do they have like a real, like, do they have a real life presence as well, or like, is their whole job just being the Sherpa? How are they being like chosen to be Sherpas? Like, what's how are people getting like matched to Sherpas? And yeah, yeah, I think those are good design questions. Then I, I envision it to be a full time thing. Matching. Okay, thank you guys.